they haven't taken a class from me uh, before. They're, they're much more informal than a Sunday morning, and we like to have fun together. And I hope that we have just a lot of fun learning about God's Word, understanding our Bible so much more. And so uh, if you don't have a handout, I we, we, uh, know we ran out, and so we printed some uh, extras, and they're out there on the table, so you can go out there and grab that at any time that you want. And so I'm going to pray here, and we are going to jump in, and we are going to get started, and we are going to learn to understand our Bibles better. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's do this. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much that we have this uh, extreme privilege to have your word given to us. And so as we spend these evenings, these weeks together, I pray that, that you would give us the capacity to understand your word better. We'll never answer all the questions, Lord. We'll, we'll never uh, understand every piece, every part, but we can understand your word better so that we can follow your word better, so that we can follow you better in this life. So thank you for what a precious gift your word is. I ask that, again that you would bless our time. You would meet with us because, Lord, you're the best teacher. And so I pray that you would be the one teaching us all about yourself and your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So um, I want to start off just by showing you a few pictures here. And we're going to put, eventually put the pictures on the screen. And also I have a, a TV up here throughout the class I may interact with uh, in the weeks to come. I want to start out by some pictures and, and connect these pictures to actual stories in the Bible because sometimes I, I feel that maybe often we, we look at the Bible more as, I don't know, mythology. Sometimes we forget these are real places. These are real people. These were real stories. And God unfolded his plan for, for mankind in these real places, again, with real people. And the privilege that Lisa and I had a few years ago was to actually go to Israel, be in these places. And I'm telling you, when you're on site in these places and being able to teach God's word my whole life and then to be there on site, it just takes a whole new level of meaning and significance. And so I want to just kind of start off with some of these places. Now, these aren't Google images. These are places that I, I took these pictures, okay? You know, so why would I show you these pictures? Some of you are going to know some of the stories I'm going to talk about very briefly tonight as we start, uh, and, uh, and some of you won't. That's okay. We'll get to them. So, um, so this is the Mediterranean Sea, and this is a port, Joppa, okay? Well, what's the significance of Joppa? Well, some of you might remember there's a story of this guy who ran from God. His name was Jonah. And Jonah didn't want to go to a place called Nineveh. And so instead of going to Nineveh, he went the other direction. Well, this is where, the, this, this actually exists. This is Joppa, where Jonah went, got on a ship, a ship went out into the Mediterranean, and met a very big fish, okay? And uh, that's, that's Jonah. This... You look at that, well, what is the significance of a place like that? Well, see, in God's Word, there's this amazing story. It's often a childhood favorite story about this little shepherd boy named David. And there was this big giant named Goliath. And there was an amazing battle between the two. It took place in a, in, in a valley called the Valley of Elah. That's the Valley of Elah. And the Philistines, the Bible says, would get on one side of the valley, and the Israelites were on the other side of the valley, and a champion named Goliath came out into the center and taunted Israel. That's where that story happened, right there. I know that looks like a bunch of rocks, but uh, it's actually a place called Beersheba. The Bible talks about the extent of Israel, and, and they'll be to the north, the place called Dan, to the south, Beersheba, and there's a lot of significance with this place in the Bible, but we're going to learn eventually about these people called the patriarchs. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. And there's a person named Isaac that we'll spend some time looking at briefly here in a couple of weeks. And he had this, uh, he, he lived in this area and he, he had this habit of digging wells. And when we were there, Beersheba, the ruins, there's a well there that, that they believe is actually one of the wells that Isaac dug. 
And here it is, you know, thousands of years later, still giving water. Now, that is a fun picture, all right? That's in a place called the Engedi. The other gentleman there is uh, Dale Robinson. In fact, he's actually here tonight. So there's two Dales in that picture right there. All right. We were traveling together with our wives in Israel back in 2016, and we spent several weeks there. That is significant because in the Bible story, as God unfolds what he's doing in the Old Testament, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, David, one of the significant figures in the Old Testament, is trying to hide from a guy named King Saul, who wants to kill him. The Bible says he went to a place called the En Gedi. The En Gedi is just a fascinating place because it's in the middle of the desert. It's just rocks and dryness everywhere, and yet there is these, these, these narrow valleys that go cut inland, and it's filled with water, filled with vegetation, and it's filled with caves where David hid. And uh, if, if I could expand the picture, over here to the left, there's a big cave over here. And you could just see David hiding with his men in that cave. This, it really has two things. This is a Roman city that, that was there during Jesus' time in the first century. But this hill back here was a Philistine stronghold. Some of you might remember a story where King Saul actually died. He died in battle, him and his sons. And the Philistines took their bodies and they <clears throat> nailed their bodies to the wall of their city. I know it sounds kind of gruesome. That's the city they nailed their bodies to was right there. <laughs> Some of you may know what that is. That's the Sea of Galilee. Sunrise on the Sea of Galilee. And in the New Testament... We're, we're going to spend next week a few, a few moments on geography. And some of you are like, oh, geography, how boring. But the biblical narrative takes place in geography. You need to understand these places as we understand God unfolding his plan in geographic places. Jesus spent a lot of time on the, on the Sea of Galilee, around the Sea of Galilee. And so we'll be looking at that too. I know this kind of looks like a boring picture, but it was significant to me because in the story where Moses, he stood on, the, on a place called Mount Nebo, and that is the place he died. And, and so we got to go to, to Mount Nebo. This is what Moses didn't get to go into the promised land. He stood on Mount Nebo looking in to the promised land, which is Israel over here. We're, we're actually in Jordan. That's where Mount Nebo is. It's not in Israel. It's in Jordan. And we were looking across into Israel, and God showed him the land that he was going to give to the nation of Israel. And that's where Moses died. This is a great picture because this is the ancient city gates of Dan, clear in the north of Israel. These things are old. They're probably close to 4,000 years old. When you read the story of Abraham, Abraham walked through those gates. Just fascinating to be there and, and read about Abraham in your Bible. Stand there and look. Abraham walked through those gates. I love this picture too because this is a New, a New Testament story where Jesus, he spent a lot of time in synagogues. This is a, a picture of the synagogue in Capernaum. And when you read the New Testament, Jesus, that was kind of his home base. And there were times he went into the synagogue and he taught in the synagogue. This is where Jesus taught. And that is me pretending to be a donkey, all right? And that is an olive press. And when Jesus said, if you cause one of these little ones to stumble, you might as well have a millstone hung around your neck and thrown into the depths of the sea. You want to know what a millstone looks like? Some of them, some of them are big. That is a millstone. That's probably a little more recognizable. It's Jerusalem. From the Mount of Olives, looking down on what's called the Temple Mount. Of course, that is the Dome of the Rock. That's right there. These are steps leading up to um, the Temple Mount. Many scholars believe that these, these are the steps where, where Peter, in, in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit showed up and he's preaching to people. And thousands of people gave their lives to Jesus on, on the day of Pentecost. Believe that that's, that's where it took place was right there. And I think that's my last one. Oh, I will. I'll get to that one. I love the pictures. I love the reminder uh, to, to, 
to all of us, again, that it's real. Real people, real stories. One of the things that we're going to do throughout the class is uh, I will be interjecting pictures and places that we've been and also videos as we go through uh, just different. Oh, Brian's waving at me back there. He, Brian's got more. If you need more outlines or anything, please raise your hand. They will get them to you since we've ran out twice. It's awesome. So let's start walking through the notes that you have in front of you. Understand your Bible, lesson number one. So here's the goal of the class. Here's, here's my heart's desire for the class. It's really simple. Is the goal of the class is to have you better understand your Bible so that you will better love your Bible, so you will better follow your Bible. And following God's word and following Jesus are, of course, we have fill-ins, right? You guys have fill-ins? Yes? No? Are they filled in for you? They're filled in for you? They all are. Bring a pen next week. They won't be next week. Okay. This is your one and only freebie. There you go. <laughs> You'll have to fill those in next week. Oh, and by the way, if um, those of you watching from home, you can get the class notes by going to our website and look under the media page. And that's where you can, uh, you can download the notes so you can follow along at home. All right. So enjoy the free one tonight. Luke 6, 46, Jesus said, so, so why do you keep calling me Lord, Lord, and you don't do what I say? Why do you call me Lord and don't follow? God's word shows us how to do this. See, following, following Jesus and following his word are one in the same. They're one in the same. You, you, we can say that, oh, I'm a follower of Jesus. Well, if you're a follower of Jesus, we have to follow his word. If you don't follow his word, then we're not following Jesus. So learning to love God's word should be the norm. Learning to love God's word should be the norm. Psalm 119, 97. Oh, how I love your instructions. I love your word. I think about them all day long. Now, that might not be true in your life tonight. I don't want you to feel guilty for that. But see, my, my heart's desire is that the more you will understand God's word, the more that verse will be true in your life. I want this verse to be true. It will become true in your life. It will become more and more meaningful in your life when you experience the word of God. The word of God, when you see that it works, when you see how it impacts your life, when you, when you see that God's word is true, then I, I am convinced that you'll say the same thing that the psalmist says. God, I love your word. Because I believe that's where we need to be going. So we're going to spend a few moments looking at the results of knowing and following the word of God. Love 2 Timothy 3. There's a couple of very, very key scriptures that we're going to look at that really define what the word of God is, what the word of God does. So 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All scripture is inspired by God. You might want to underline that, inspired by God. It's literally breathed out by God. It's not written simply by man. It wasn't mankind's idea. It wasn't their opinion. It, it wasn't their will. God did this. It is his word. It is inspired by God. It's not inspired by man. It's useful. Now, here's what it does. To teach us what is true, make us realize what is wrong in our lives, it corrects us when we're wrong. It teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. So notice all the, the benefits of the word of God. It teaches us what is true. First thing. It teaches us what is true. Men and women, this is so significant. It always has been significant, but more so now, I think, than ever. We live in a world that is obsessed and believes relativism. Relativism is basically there's no absolute truth. You, you can, you know, truth is what's true for you. My truth, you know, that, that phrase we hear over and over and over again. God's word is true. And the majority of people, again, they, they don't believe that. I wish statistically Christians believed it, but only 43% of professing believers, those who profess to have accepted Christ as their Savior, only 43% believe in absolute moral truth. Only 43%. It's like, wow. 
But God's word said it teaches us what is true. I also believe that I believe that there's a hunger for truth more than any other time than I've ever seen. I think the middle ground's kind of going away. I, I see people that are so tired of the falsehoods. They, they, they may not know what the truth is, but they're just they're getting so tired of the falsehood. And I think there is a, a time and a moment right now in history where, where people are more hungry for something that's true, something that doesn't change. And that is, that, that is the gift of the Word of God. It teaches us what is true. So there is truth that doesn't change, that's unalterable, that's eternal. And that's God's Word. Makes us realize what is wrong in our lives. I love the word realize because uh, what the Word of God will do as you read it, you'll, you'll have these, uh, I can call them light bulb moments. Light bulb moments, you just, you realize, all of a sudden, God gives you clarity. He opens your eyes, he opens your mind, he, he gives you comprehension to, to who you are, makes us realize, though, what is wrong. That sounds kind of negative, but it's not, because wrong takes life from us. The wages of sin is death. Wrong takes life. It, God's word is not here to make you feel guilty all the time. It's not there to control you, but it does need to show us, show us what we're doing wrong, help us realize what's wrong, because wrong damages us. Wrong damages uh, uh, us as people, our relationships. It hinders us from the purpose that God has for us. So when you read that, you know, don't kind of cringe and go, oh, it helps me realize what's wrong. We all have things wrong in our life. It doesn't just stop there. It says it corrects us when we're wrong. So it, it helps us stop what damages us. So it, it helps me realize what's wrong. And then it corrects me. So it's like, okay, this has to stop. It's a correction, but then it goes on and says it teaches us to do what's right. So it's no, not this way, not this path, but this is the right way. It teaches us to do what's right. And I love this last one too. It prepares and equips us to do every good work. God's word is an equipping tool. It's, it's a tool that God uses to prepare us, and it says every good work. Every good work. It's not just work in the church. It's not just work serving God in the church. Yes, 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 it can be part of that. But every good work that you do, it prepares you to be a better husband, a, a better wife, a better parent, a better employee. Every good work. Every, every good thing that we need to do in this life, the Word of God has influence over us. If you want to be equipped for every good work in this life, we must understand the Word of God. We must give it our attention. We must give it our priority. How can this verse uh, prove to be true if we're confused about the very book that is supposed to change our lives? And so that's... that's why we're spending time in this class? Because I think if we remove some of the confusion, some of the, some of the, the, some of the mystery, we'll pursue it more. So if this book truly came from God himself, and it did, then it deserves our time and our effort and our study to understand it. And I hope that's what we do during these 20 weeks is that we give the word of God the priority in our life that it needs. So if this book is God's tool to change our lives, how can we ignore gaining a greater understanding of the contents? And of course, you know, my uh, opinion is we can't. We can't. We need to give ourselves to this. Even, even if, if it's a struggle to understand. I mean, I, I don't know about you, sometimes learning is a struggle, but it's worth it. I love Hebrews 4.12. Here's another very key verse that talks about the Word of God and what it is and what it does. It says, for the Word of God is alive. It is powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. So here you go. The Bible, first of all, is a supernatural book. It is a supernatural book. Because it came from God. He's the one who wrote it. It's his truth. It's not a dead book. It is an alive book. It has been alive, okay, for thousands of years, folks. It's supernatural. It has supernatural results. 
It's alive and powerful, it says. It's powerful. I believe it's a weapon for defense. It talks about it being a two-edged sword. And we do have a spiritual enemy. And we need to know the word of God as we stand against our spiritual enemy. Because he is a master of deception. And if we do not know truth, we are being deceived. The sharpest two-edged sword. It was also cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow, exposing the innermost thoughts and desires. So it's a weapon for defense of your life. It's also precise as a surgeon's scalpel to heal your life. And God's word is that precise. It just knows how to separate. It just, it just knows what you need to hear. The Bible is also a moral and spiritual mirror. It says that it exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. It shows us who we really are. And I'm convinced is, this is why it's often ignored. It's often avoided not because of a lack of understanding, but because we understand it all too well. It shows us that we're not right. It shows us that we're sinful people. It shows us that we're separated from God. It shows us that, that we're traveling down a wrong path. It shows us that my life is, revolves around me and not God. And, and so sometimes we avoid it. I had a professor years ago when I was a, a freshman at Multnomah Bible College back then. That's what they called it. That was a couple years ago. Yes, 1983. That was a couple years ago. His name was John Lawrence, and he coined a phrase that has stuck with me for decades. I even wrote it in the front of one of my Bibles when I first heard it. He says, this book will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from this book. True statement. Because it reveals. And if we don't want to follow Jesus, then you do not want to follow, you don't want to, you don't want to read the book. Because it will expose your innermost thoughts and desires. Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. The Bible is like a GPS system for decision making. I know some people just might be shocked to even hear that. Decision making, the word of God, the Bible. Now, GPS, from my, my perspective, that stands for God's positioning system, all right? When you follow God's word, he positions your life right where it needs to be. You make decisions based on the word of God. If we're going to follow Jesus, we make decisions based on the word of God. We use it as a guide, not just for our morality, but, but it's like, what, Lord, how do I live my life? What do I do in relationships? What, what do I do w w in conflict? Uh, what do I do at work? What do I, you're going, the word of God tells us how to do that? Yes. Gives you principles, gives you truth, gives you values. For all of that. I know I say we don't have to be that smart. That's not to offend anybody, okay? I mean, some of you are way smarter than me, all right? We simply, but we simply need to know what God's word tells us to do and follow that. You know the comfort there is in making decisions on truth? Comfort there is in making decisions based on what God's word tells you to do? If God's word is true, it's always right. It's always right. Wouldn't you like to make right decisions more often than not? When you make them on the, on the word of God, it's right every time. <clears throat> For some extra study just on the benefits of the word of God, one of my favorite psalms is 119. It's very long, all right, but it is a great psalm. You might want to go home and, and just, just read through that. Or if, if you want to be an overachiever, you can write down all of the benefits. This psalm is Filled with benefits of the word of God. And it just lists them. And it goes through them one after another. Like I said, it's one of my favorite psalms that talks about the powerful influence the word of God can have on your life. It's a great psalm to read and say, God, I want that. I want that in my life. I want the word of God to be that in my life. Psalm, or I mean, Isaiah 5.13. It says, therefore, my people, well, they go into exile. I love, this, this phrase is fascinating. For a lack of understanding, God was actually going to send his people into exile. We will get to talking about that time in biblical history and why it's important, so we'll get there. But they disobeyed God, and God was going to send them into exile. But he says, for a lack of understanding, they did not understand my way, my truth. Often our lives, 
I believe we're in bondage simply because we do not understand and follow God's word. We're no different. We're absolutely no different. We, we, we live in bondage to habits, to attitudes, wrong thinking, destructive behaviors. And, and in a way, we're in bondage simply because of a lack of understanding. It's, it's not that we're trying to be rebellious. It's just that we don't know the word of God. And so we're influenced by the world and its teaching and its lies. And, and we're, no, we're just no different than them. So the more of God's word you know, the more freedom you experience. The more freedom that you're going to experience. Now I want you to listen to Jesus, and <clears throat> I know this, uh, I, I just love this John 8, 32 passage. Jesus says you're going to know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And some of us that have been in church, we love that verse. Like, yes! But I want to give a broader understanding of something that we need to understand as we lay a foundation for the future weeks to come, and, and even for your future reading. So in your notes, it says, Jesus spoke his words from a Hebrew mindset. You're going, well, why is that important? Well, I'm going to explain just very, very simplistically the difference between a Greek mindset and a Hebrew mindset. Because as we go through the word of God and as you read the word of God, it is very, very important for you to understand the difference between the two. Other words, otherwise you are going to have the wrong lens that you read God's word through. Let me explain. The Greek mindset is linear and it's knowledge-based. If you mentally know it, you can do it. There's just a simple way to explain it. If you mentally know it, therefore you can do something. If you can recite it, if you can explain it, therefore you can do it. That's a Greek model of learning. Jesus did not grow up or promote that model. He was a Jew. He was a Hebrew rabbi. And so the Hebrew mindset is more holistic, and it is experience-based. Very different. It's like this. <clears throat> There's the phrase. When you can do it, you know it. Not the other way around. Greek model. If you know it, you can do it. Hebrew model. When you do it, you know it. Big difference. Therefore, when Jesus said, you know the truth... If you know the truth, if you think of it through a Greek lens, well, all I have to do is read the Bible and know the truth, and it should set me free. How come I'm not? Right? It's because Jesus didn't speak it from that perspective. When Jesus says you're going to know the truth, the truth will set you free, he was saying when you experience the truth, when you live the truth, when you apply the truth, that's when it sets you free. And that's why we have so many people in church who have grown up in church who are obsessed with knowledge alone and their lives look no different than the world. Greek model, Hebrew model. When you read God's word, so when you look at that, if you will know the truth, when you finally start applying the truth, live the truth, that is when it's all going to start clicking. That's when you experience the supernatural qualities of the word of God in your life and not before. I guess I better get back to my notes. Let me find out where I'm at. Yeah, here we go. Greek thinking heavily influences our Western culture today. We've come to adopt that to know something is merely an intellectual exercise. We've taken this cultural understanding, wrapped our Christianity into this. Now knowing Jesus has become a mental exercise and the Bible is something we need to only intellectually understand. Wrong. That's just, it's, it's. What that will produce in your life is you're going to read God's word and you're going to read God's word and see all the supernatural stuff and you're going to say, how come I'm not experiencing that? It's because you're, you're, you're understanding it through a Greek lens. I know it. And Jesus would say, yeah, but you don't do it. The power's in the doing. That's, that's why here at Foothills, we, we always talk about obedience equals blessing. Why do we say that? Hebrew model. You're not blessed because you know it. You're blessed because you do it. That's what Jesus said. That's what God says. 
This is why, as a church, we are, we're, we're an application-based ministry. What do you mean by that? It's because we, we always focus on application. Always focus on application. I must never, even at a Bible class, I am never going to get up here and give you content without asking you to do it. Because that's the Hebrew model. you got to do it. Then you know it. We become more impressed with people's Bible knowledge than their life knowledge. Greek way. From Jesus' perspective, again, you don't really know biblical truth until you live biblical truth. Jesus is more concerned with lifestyle than your knowledge. So some of you are like, well, I don't know much about the Bible. I'm good with that, so is Jesus. If you're living what you know, he's pretty happy with you. Sometimes I think we're all, if we've grown up in church, we're educated beyond our level of experience. There's the danger. I know more than I live. So I don't want you to have a, just a greater mental understanding of the Bible after this class. That is not my goal at all. In fact, that would break my heart if that's all that happened. I want you to live the Bible better after this class. I, I want you to be able to follow Jesus better after this class. So that's my heart. I do want to ask you to develop a habit. And so I want to take a, a few moments and, and talk about this. That... Uh, Yes, I'm going to talk about reading your Bible every day. And so uh, to make that easier for you, some of you already have that habit. Just fantastic. I'm, I'm so, I'm, I'm glad. Good job. Because I think that habit, that habit alone could have the single greatest impact on your spiritual development. So, so if you haven't developed that habit, I hope that during the, these 20 weeks that this will be the time when you begin to get that spiritual habit developed. So get a Bible app on your phone, get it on your iPad, get it on your computer. For those of you that commute, I have always said, get that thing, you know, use your phone, listen to it on the way in. You know, stop listening to talk radio and other things and um, you know, worship music. That's cool too. It really is. But you got to get God's word in you. And, and so there's all kinds of ways to do that. Set aside a time every day, and don't just listen to it. Reflect on how you live it. Now, you were given when you came in a, um, I'm going to try to find it here. Here we go. A reading plan. And it's, it's probably unlike any reading plan you've ever seen because there are very specific books that are placed on this reading plan. Let me say this. You can use this or not. I, I, I'm more concerned with you reading your Bible every day. But this reading plan is a way for you to read through the story in the Bible in a chronological way. And in a few moments, I will explain what that means. There's actually 14 books. You know there's 66 books in the Bible? But if you read just these 14 books, you will have read through in a chronological way the entire story of the Bible. Right there. 14 books. You read a couple of chapters a day, we can all get through that by Easter. So that was kind of the goal. Some of you just have never done that before. So it's a, a kind of a neat way to do that. So I provided that for you. Some of you are highly disciplined in reading your Bible and you're going, I don't want to take a break from my reading plan. Then don't. It's okay. All right. But if you don't have one and you've never read through the Bible before, that would be a great tool. Like I said, and I'll explain that here in just a second. So I'm going to give you a few uh, general overview of the Bible principles, some bullet points that are there. So uh, the Bible contains 66 individual books, 66 books. There are 39 Old Testament books. There are 27 New Testament books. And you're thinking, Testament, what do you mean by Testament? Great question. The word Testament means covenant or agreement. God had an agreement. He had a covenant with the people in the it, it, in the Old Testament, it was going to work like this. And then Jesus comes onto the scene, and there is a new agreement. There is a new testament. There is a new covenant between God and man. So you have an old, you have a new. What's the theme of the Bible? God's plan of redemption. Simple. Well, redemption. It's God saving humanity. God calling humanity back to him. Back to their original design. We were made for relationship. God's plan of redemption. The entire Bible has one theme. That is it. Old Testament, New Testament. Yeah, but the Old Testament is so hard to understand. Same theme. 
And, and we will explain that to you so you understand. It has 66 books, you know, two different you know, Old Testament, New Testament, but one's overarching theme through the whole thing. In the Old Testament, God's plan of redemption was to use the nation of Israel. In the New Testament, in our current day, God uses the church. It's the most simplistic way to understand it. God wanted the world to know him. He's always wanted the world to know him. So in the Old Testament, he uses a nation. He creates a nation called Israel. And Israel was going to be a testimony to the entire world so people would know God. God's plan of redemption. He's going to use a nation. New Testament, God has a plan. He's going to use this thing called the church. Same plan. New Testament, Old Testament. Different way of doing it. The writing of the entire Bible spans around 1,500 years. There are at least 40 different authors. Pretty incredible. The Bible is not written or compiled in chronological order. Some of you know that. Some of you don't. That's why when you read it, it's so confusing. You, you want to read it like a normal book. You just open that thing up. You start reading, and you're going, okay, this makes sense. Whoa, what is going on? And you get lost, and you quit reading. We're going to explain that. It's not written in chronological order. Which, again, can be very confusing. The Bible has been preserved with amazing accuracy. We will talk about that in here because I'm sure that you have had people that say, why do you read the Bible for? Give me a break. It is filled with errors. It's so inaccurate. It has been copied and translated wrong throughout the centuries. There's all kinds of inconsistencies. And when people say that to me, I go, which ones? And you're talking about what? Well, can you give me an example? And usually they go quiet because they have no idea what they're talking about. And that's not to be critical of other people. It's, it's just that they're usually parroting something that they've heard. The Bible has the, been preserved with incredible accuracy, folks. Incredible accuracy. The Dead Sea Scrolls, we'll talk about that later here, uh, has revealed the accuracy of the Old Testament. Those 39 Old Testament books. Some of the, the books they found in this, in this place uh, called Qumran, which we'll show you in the caves uh, up above there. They found a complete copy of the book of Isaiah that was dated to 125 B.C. Up until that time, the, the oldest copy we had was 800 A.D. thousand years almost between the two. When they compared them, they were li literally identical. thousand years between the two. Identical. It has been preserved with amazing accuracy. And if, if, if it really was God's word, you would expect that, right? God can preserve his word. The Old Testament that we have today was the same Old Testament that Jesus knew and quoted. Isn't that something? We have the same one. The New Testament letters uh, written by primarily apostles existed for hundreds of years during the Roman persecution. These letters were shared among churches. They were circulated among churches. So the church began. These, the New Testament letters written by, uh, by Jesus' apostles were circulated. were written and circulated in those churches. And within less than 100 years, the church that circulated these letters were circulating and, and had basically compiled our current New Testament. It wasn't until... In 397 A.D., at the Council of Carthage, they established what's called the Orthodox New Testament canon. The word canon means standard. It's the standard that we have today. They didn't compile those books in 397. They simply agreed to what the church had been using for several hundred years, folks. They had a few other weird books that they were looking at. But those, the, our New Testament has been around since less than 100 years after Jesus. So when somebody says that, oh, they put that Bible together years later, not so much. Not true. Now, what I want to do with the time we have left is explain this chart. And it's a chart that's trying to explain how the Bible is put together. You have that in your, your outline, in your notes. I realize that sometimes charts are very, very helpful for, for, for people, and sometimes charts are just confusing. So if this chart doesn't help you in any way, it's okay. It, it really is. And, and so there's nothing wrong with you. I have been in classes and seminars before, and the guy pulls out the chart, and I'm so confused. It just didn't click at all. So if that's you, that's fine. But 
Sometimes charts are helpful. And so books of the Bible, an overview. This top line up here is kind of when they were written. When those Bible, when those Bible books were written. This line right here. Very important line I want you to pay attention to because this reflects your Bible reading um, plan that you've been given. If you wanted to read the Bible in a chronological way so it moves the story forward, these are the books that you would read. Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Joshua, Judges, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, Ezra, Nehemiah, read Matthew, read Acts, read Revelation. Boom! You read 14 books out of 66 and you just read it through chronologically. So good. Some of that makes sense to you. You're going, okay, well that's cool. What about the rest? Now, now remember, this is God's plan of redemption. You read those 14 books, you got God's plan of redemption. Chronologically, how it played out in history. Kind of a neat way to read your Bible. But some of you are like, hey, there's a bunch more books. How do those fit? That's a great question. So, as we come down here to the next line, you have First and Second Chronicles. Primarily what this describes is the same history up here. That's why it's in that line written by different people, sometimes from a different perspective, from, and, and sometimes you get additional information in some of those historical stories. Because sometimes you'll read through First and Second Kings, for, and then you get chronicles, you're like, hey, this is repeating. It does repeat, written by some different people. But fascinating, and you get some new stuff in there. It starts in Genesis with genealogies. That's why the line goes here, and it ends during the time of Ezra. That's why the line goes there. What about these other books? This is where it gets confusing. Because you start reading in, in, in Genesis, okay? You start reading in Genesis, and it's chronological. It's moving the story forward. And you get into Exodus, and, and the story's moving forward. And all of a sudden, boom. Leviticus? Some of you have read Leviticus. We're not going to spend a lot of time there in this class, okay? So relax. Someone's already asked me that. It's okay, all right? Old Testament law, dietary stuff. I mean, it's it's can be helpful in another class. But this one, it's not moving the story forward. And, and so you're confused. And then, you, okay, you get to numbers. Oh, the story moves forward again. Then boom, back down here. Oh, it's Moses. And he's just talking to people. And it's like, what's going on? See, it's confusing. But it, it happens during this time frame. So that's why they're in order. You have the book of Joshua. You go into Judges. This is the book of Ruth. That's what R stands for, Ruth. Some of you don't, have never read that book. Some of you have read that book. It happens during this time frame, during the period of the judges. If you don't understand that, the book of Ruth won't make sense to you. So some of this history is important to understand when the books were written. I didn't, I didn't talk about this one. This is Job. Why is Job way back here? A lot of people believe the book of Job is one of the oldest uh, of the Bible books. Most scholars believe it was, it was written sometime during the book of Genesis. So that's why it's way over here. But you don't get to Job until you're, you know, way this way. All right. These other books, uh, you have uh, Psalms down here. You know, it's Moses writes the first one. And you have Ezra who, who writes the last one. Uh, you have David who writes many of them. And that's why it's in here. You have Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. And, and so these three here, Saul. King Saul, King David, King Solomon. You have 120 years of a, of a united kingdom. 120 years where, where Israel was a united kingdom. You have a split that takes place in 1 Kings. Very significant what takes place where they have a civil war, basically. And the, the, there are 12 tribes of Israel, and they divide and ten tribes go to the north and two to the south. And from that point on, the northern tribes are called Israel. I thought everything was Israel. It was until that time. If you do not understand this, things start not making sense. Every time they refer to Israel, they're always referring to the northern kingdom. They talk about Judah. Who's Judah? That's just not one tribe. It's the southern kingdom. Even though ten went to the north, two to the south. And and now every time you hear Judah, it's talking about the southern kingdom. Because the northern kingdom was so rebellious, the Assyrians came in in 722 B.C. and decimated them. Took them captives, exiled them. 
The southern tribes were a little more righteous. They lasted longer. But in 586 B.C., the Babylonians came in, destroyed Jerusalem, burned the temple, tore down the wall. And then you have here 70 years of captivity where God exiled them because of their disobedience. After 70 years, God allowed them to come back. You have the book of Ezra where they go back and they rebuild the temple. And then you have Nehemiah, and Nehemiah goes back and he rebuilds the wall of Jerusalem. Esther, that's what this was, takes place during the time of Ezra. They were contemporaries. Very significant to understand that. Otherwise, Esther doesn't make a lot of sense. Some of you are like, well, what about all those other books I don't like to read about those, those prophets, you know? Yeah, there's a lot of Old Testament prophets. You know, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. What about those? Woo, yeah, right, yeah. Yeah, big deal. He can go buy all books, okay? <laughs> but where do you live, right? That's the question. So here's a, a way to understand how to understand the, those, those, those Old Testament prophets. Because I know people avoid those books like the plague. Nobody wants to read those books. But there are gems in those books. Oh, my goodness. So here's how you understand those books. First of all, there are three prophets who prophesied after the captivity. Okay? Okay. So you have Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. They prophesy, here's the captivity. They prophesy in this time frame, right here. Those three, only three. Two prophets, Ezekiel and Daniel. Those two books, they, they're during the captivity. They're exiles in a foreign land. And though, again, those books make no sense unless you understand that. And then all the rest of the prophets. See, that's the easy way to do it. Just all the rest. They are all before this exile. They're all messages of calling the nation of Israel, the nation of Judah, back to God. Saying, listen, if you don't turn, if you don't repent, if you don't trust his way, if you don't trust his truth, if you don't come back, there's consequences for this. And God said, if we reject him, he will exile us from the land. And so those messages are, are taking place in a variety of different ways in those books. And then you have 400 silent gears, and I can't wait next week. I'm going to talk about that because they were not silent. It just means that there wasn't a scripture being written during that time. But what took place during those 400 silent years, which we will talk about next week, the Bible says when the fullness of time, the fullness of time okay, came, Jesus showed up. God sent his son. God used this time frame in human history to set the stage for the arrival of his son. And it's fascinating to talk about that because if it was the perfect time in world history, the perfect time for Jesus to show up on the stage. And I know some of you are like, what do you mean? That's next week. Okay. And then you have the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels. Why do we have four Gospels? Why do we have four different stories of Jesus? Well, we'll talk about that when we get there. But they all have four different purposes, different audiences. And, uh, and we need four of them. You go into the book of Acts. So this is a uh, historical book, how the church began. And if you've never read the book of Acts, it's fascinating to see what God did. Church is messy, you know? I know some people don't like me saying that. Read the book of Acts. It's messy, all right? And then these are the epistles. What are epistles? Nobody uses that word. Letters, right? Letters. This is a fancy word for letters, so the apostles wrote letters to the churches that were established. These, these letters were inspired by God to help the church follow Jesus. And so we have them today, which, which is the majority of your New Testament. And then this last book, people just are so fascinated with. Some of you might be familiar with the book of Revelation. And no, normally during a Bible class, everybody wants to know, Pastor, are we going to talk about Revelation Yes, briefly. And if you really want a class on the end times, I did one last year, and you can go to our website, and you can actually watch it. A six-week class on the end times. And uh, you, can, you can get your fill with that, but Revelation is a fascinating book. And yes, it has some end times instructions for us. So there is your chart, kind of an overview of the Bible. So, 
Tonight was simply a uh, kind of a, a start, a foundation. Next week, we're going to start working our way through. Next week, I am going to talk about some geography of the Bible and why it's important. And then also, we're going to be uh, giving you a summary of all of the major segments of the Old Testament. And then I'm going to back up the following weeks. I'm going to go through every one, one at a time. And uh, you are going to understand the Old Testament in the next 10 weeks better than you ever have. Guaranteed it. So I'm going to wrap up. It's already almost 8 o'clock. Thanks for being here tonight. Thanks for, uh, thanks for learning and letting God work in us. So, and those watching from home, thank you as well. And uh, let's pray. So, Lord Jesus, thank you for tonight. Thank you again for your word. Thank you for your word. Your word is life, Lord. Your word is true. Your word is eternal. Your word is unchanging. Your word is living. And so, Lord, I I pray your word would be that and more in all of us. I pray that you would light in us a desire for your word unlike any other time in our lives. Not just to know it, but to live it. And then, Lord, I pray that we would experience just how alive it really is. So, Lord, we love you. And we want to love your word even more, too. Help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you tonight. I'll see you next week. Mm.